Hello and welcome to Stress and Disease. Here we're going to talk about the process that occurs when your body becomes overwhelmed and how the body is going to be able to deal with that. This is really all based on the whole idea of the fight or flight response, which is supposed to be an adaptative response in order to be able to help you to be able to get out of a bad situation and to be able to preserve your life, really. But in a lot of cases, in most cases, really, in most of our lives, stress is going to be a non-productive type of event that is going to lead to disease forming and end up causing all sorts of bad things for us. This is a good definition of what stress is. So just take a moment to read this through to give yourself a little background on what a definition of stress would be before we move forward talking about how stress affects the body. We attribute many of our modern day ways of thinking to Dr. Hans Selye when it regards stress and stressors in our body. What he was doing is he kind of set out here originally to discover a new sex hormone. What he found instead was that there's many different hormones, many different parts of the body that are going to be causing stress and stressors and involved in the stress response. So he kind of initiated this whole field of studying stress. The way that the body would respond to having a stressful situation, and by the way, a stressful situation can be something that is not physical. We talked about fight or flight, but stressful situation can be just as easily something that is emotional or perceived and mental and maybe not even something that's happening right now at all. But Dr. Sellier called the response that we have to stress the general adaptation syndrome. So this is the, uh, the common term that we use in order to be able to talk about the things that happen when somebody is going through a stressful situation. He perceived this as being primarily physiologic. So again, he was study, studying hormones in the body, so he was studying a physiological process. We have gone on to find that uh, this same process occurs when we have mental stress as well. In the general adaptation syndrome, there are three main stages, the first of which is the alarm stage, then we have the resistance or adaptation stage, and finally we have the exhaustion stage. So starting out in the alarm stage, this is when the body is triggered for that fight or flight. So maybe you are being attacked by a tiger in the alarm stage kicks in and it gives you that extra adrenaline that you're going to need to be able to fight or flight. So it activates the sympathetic nervous system by way of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and that allows us to have enough epinephrine, norepinephrine in our bodies that are going to be able to fight or flight and get out of that particular situation. That's the alarm stage. However, if this stressor continues. So we are being chased by this lion for a period of hours or days. We start to get into this resistance or adaptation stage. Now we're going to start to have some of the uh, mobilization of our fight or flight response getting to the point where we're starting to resist or we're starting to adapt to this process. And lastly, we will end up eventually in the exhaustion phase where if the stress continues, we use up our stress hormones and the adaptation is not successful and then this can lead to the person ending up having disorders. One of the ways this, that this occurs is by having decreased immune and inflammatory function as a result of the high levels of epinephrine, and norepinephrine and cortisol that are floating around in the body while this is happening. What this slide is illustrating is the alarm response. So we have the stimulus that has signaled the brain. The brain is then signaling the nerve impulse. The nerve signal there is going down to the medulla along with some ACTH and that is going to stimulate the renal medulla to be producing epinephrine, cortisol that releases glucose from the liver, also increases our heart rate, our breathing rate, our blood sugar, our blood pressure in an attempt to have those things available for fight or flight. So if you needed to actually fight or flight, so we got this lion chase us here. We need more cardiac output. We need more glucose. We need to have 
more air, more oxygen getting to the tissues. So we need to have all of these components working for fight or flight. Now just imagine if this were then to occur for a long period of time where we have an increase in glucose. Well, you know, we talk about diabetics and diabetics have an increase in glucose for a long period of time. And there's all sorts of bad complications that occur from having that elevated glucose over a period of time. The increased heart rate, the increased blood pressure, that's going to lead to cardiac dysfunction, that's going to lead to high blood pressure and maybe some atherosclerotic disease, etc. Increase in our breathing rate could lead to problems with the lungs. So the patient could be developing some air trapping and COPD and other things. So there's lots of long-term complications that can occur from having this chronic stress response that is going in our body. Now keep in mind, again, I'm talking about being chased by a lion, but we get the same response if we're under high levels of emotional stress as well. Psychologically, in the 1950s, there were some researchers that found that a psychological event could also cause the same general adaptation response that we saw physiologically. And we could get the same kind of responses, a reactive response, an anticipatory response, and or a conditional response that is psychologically induced. Now please take a moment to just look at this non-exhaustive list of different problems that are either caused by or can be exacerbated by having stress. So all of these things are either caused by or certainly stress compounds the problems that we have associated with these different disease and illnesses. So atherosclerotic disease, because it increases our heart rate or blood pressure, etc. It's causing scarring on the inside of the blood vessel walls and atherosclerosis. Irritable bowel syndrome can be caused by having stress stress. Cortisol is released and that's going to interfere with having normal bowel function or normal digestive function. Ulcers, we have increased in the amount of acid that is being produced in the stomach. Asthma, because we have too much stimulation of those bronchi from our stress hormones. Autoimmune disorders, because uh, whenever our stress response is going at full tilt, we're going to have problems with having a normal inflammatory and immune response, anxiety, delayed wound healing. So the list goes on and on of all the different conditions that are associated with having this abnormal, or maybe not abnormal, but having this uncontrolled stress response. So the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is the response kind of the feedback system here that occurs when we have a stress response. So the person interprets this event, the lion chasing them, as being stressful, which causes the central nervous system to produce corticotropin releasing hormone and ACTH. That then is going to stimulate the endocrine system, being the adrenals, to secrete cortisol and catecholamines. Catecholamines include epinephrine and norepinephrine. They will then cause problems with our immune system because of the high levels of cortisol and catecholamines, it will interfere with our normal immune function. This is a very busy slide here, and obviously I don't want you to know all of the details on this slide, but just take a moment here to take a look at the slide and see all of the different components that are going to happen in the body, all of the different functions that are going to happen as a result of having that stressor. So we're moving down into the central nervous system, the hypothalamus. We talked about those things already. Sympathetic nervous system is activated, causing epinephrine, norepinephrine, and our neuropeptides to be activated. Now look at that cascade of events that occur as a result of having those things activated, the catecholamines that are activated in the body. Now move over to the right-hand side and you can see that the anterior pituitary is going to stimulate the release of cortisol and some of the functions that cortisol is going to have in the body. Now again, these functions are very helpful if we're in a fight-or-flight response and we need to get out of that situation immediately. But if this is a chronic stressor, you can see how activation of these pieces toward the bottom is going to really have a very negative effect on our patient. So you might even want to take a moment here to pause the video at this point just so that you can look at this diagram in a little bit more detail.
So this diagram here is just giving a little bit more detail about how stressors are going to have an effect upon our immune system. So you see down here at the bottom our cellular immunity, our humor humoral immunity, they're going to be affected by stress in the body, the activation of our monocytes, the activation of our mast cells and histamine release. So Again, these things are connected. We can't disconnect it and say, all right, we're still going to have good immune function and good inflammatory function when we have stress. Stress is going to impair those things. Now, hopefully after the initial stressor, let's say, for example, you're in a car accident, obviously a very stressful situation, but hopefully after that initial event, you're going to have a period of time where the stress level is decreased so that you can have good wound healing and you can have recovery occur. The idea of a connection between our mental state and our psychological state and our ability to have normal immune function has been studied in a lot of different ways. And one of the sciences in looking at this connection is called psychoneural immunology. Psychoneural immunology looks at our conscious effect of our brain on our brain and spinal cord, on our immune function in the body. Very interesting field of study, studying how the way we think can actually affect the hormones that are released and our immune function. So you've probably heard of people who had a really good positive outlook and they got better from cancer, for example, because of their really good positive outlook, or at least that's what they thought was the thing that cured it. And certainly there's a lot of times we don't have a good scientific explanation, so maybe it is. But this is a very good explanation for why things like that could occur. The stress hormones that are going to be released during a stressful situation include the catecholamines. Catecholamines are released from the adrenal and medulla, and they're going to be broken down into two major types, which is epinephrine and norepinephrine. Of these types of catecholamines, we have some that are going to affect alpha adrenal receptors and some that are going to affect beta adrenergic receptors. Okay, now there's you can see there's alpha-1 and alpha-2, beta-1 and beta-2, and these are going to affect different parts of the body. However, for the time being, just remember that the alpha receptors are primarily vascular, whereas the beta receptors are primarily on the heart. So if we're thinking of the beta as being more of the heart type of receptor, alpha being more of the vasculature, it'll make a lot of sense then for some of the medications that you give to your patients. For example, with patients who have cardiac problems, we often give them beta blockers. We're giving them a medication that's going to block beta adrenergic receptors so that they don't have as much of a response to the catecholamine on the heart. That would probably be a good thing if somebody's had a heart attack, so we're not stressing the heart by making it pound faster and harder. Another stress hormone is cortisol. Cortisol is activated by adrenocorticotropic hormone, and it's going to stimulate gluconeogenesis, the making of new glucose. So it's going to help to elevate the blood glucose level. It's also a very powerful anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive agent, which is why, since it's anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive, it's why the person's going to have problems with their immune system, potentially, when we have a stressful situation or a stress response. These hormones are going to be released into the bloodstream when the person has some kind of an accident, illness, injury, etc., that is going to cause acute inflammation. Beta endorphins are proteins that are found in the brain that have pain relieving capabilities. So when we have that initial stressor, these are going to be released that are going to help to decrease the amount of pain that we're feeling at that time. So you may break an arm or something like that. Well, endorphins are going to be released into the bloodstream so that the pain is not as severe in case you know that you're being chased by this lion and you need to fight or flight, you're able to get out of there rather than focusing on the pain. So this is going to be one of the components, one of the hormones that's released when we have an illness or injury. However, the 
endorphin is going to release, at least is going to decrease over time, so then the pain is going to start to become more severe. Growth hormone is released in an attempt to try to rebuild areas that have become injured. This is also going to enhance our immune function at the area of insult, but it can affect the way that we metabolize our protein, lipid, and carbohydrates and may counter the effects of insulin. Prolactin is another hormone released during the stress response, which is primarily responsible for lactation and breast development, but it's going to increase as a result of our stressful injury, our stressful stimuli, and can lead to having some decreases in our immune capabilities. Oxytocin is another stress-induced hormone, which may help to reduce some of the anxiety seen in that very stressful situation. During stressful situations, testosterone can also be altered, and that's going to affect our immunosuppressive activity as well. Estrogen and melatonin may also be released during that stressful situation and may actually help to have a calming effect during the stress. The immune system is going to be directly affected by our stress response. There's a link that directly connects stress to immune function and then to disease. Now, this doesn't mean that every time you fall down and break an arm that you're going to end up getting cancer. Uh, it's not uh, that kind of a thing. But if we have a lot of psychological stress in our life, that could decrease our immune function, leading to the development of disease later on. And we've already seen that there's lots of neuroendocrine factors that come into play when we have a stressful response that's occurring in the body. We're going to have decrease in our C, T cell cytotoxicity and our B cell function when we have stress. Well, you may or may not have heard that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said many years ago that pain is whatever the patient says it is, existing whenever the patient says it does. Well, stress is very similar. Stress is what the patient says it is because different people are going to respond differently to different kinds of stress. And you know those people who can push your buttons, right? Now, if somebody else were to say the same thing to you, it's very unlikely that you're going to have the same level of response. But you have that particular response because that particular person just happens to know the right thing to say that's going to cause you to develop the stress. So it is a interdependent process that depends upon our previous experience, our history, uh, pe particular people we're in contact with, or particular situations. So it's not independent of those things. So for example, again, if you're being chased around your backyard by a lion, you'd probably feel a lot more stress than if you saw a lion running at the zoo. So different situation, and in those two different situations, you're going to have different individualized responses to that. The adverse consequences of stress can be minimized by coping. Well, again, if a lion's chasing me around my backyard, I don't think I really want to start working on coping mechanisms at that time. However, I could work on coping mechanisms for handling anxiety with exams and handling anxieties with studying and um, juggling multiple type of uh, uh, deadlines and uh, other types of stresses that you have in your personal life and your school life. What the diagram is trying to illustrate here is in letter A at the top, we have a stressful life event. Now, the person who has ineffective coping will end up having a significant stress response, which is we could call that distress or illness. If they have effective coping, then there may just be a transient type of effect and then return to a steady state. 
If the person is symptomatic and they have a stressful life event and they have ineffective coping, likelihood is that they're going to have an exacerbation of their illness. Their illness is going to get worse. If they have effective coping, then the chances are there will be little or no effect on the symptoms they're having from their illness when they have that stressful life event. That's why it's so important that we are teaching, first of all, ourselves that we're learning effective coping mechanisms, but then we're teaching those to our patients so that when they have an illness and they have a stressful life event, it won't make their symptoms and possibly their illness worse. Well, as I'm sure you could have guessed, there are going to be changes that occur with aging and how well we are able to manage this stress response. Now, you might think, well, the older we get, probably the better we're going to get at coping. We've been through more life events and we're able to find ways to cope with different types of life events. But the problem occurs in that we're going to have less control over some of these stress mechanisms, the physiologic stress mechanisms in the body. And that's where we end up having a lot of problems with stress. So in our aging population, we can have immunodepression, we can have alterations in our lipoproteins, hypercoagulation of the blood, leading to clots forming. That could lead to a myocardial infarction, a stroke, or a pulmonary embolism. And we have free radical damage of cells. So remember those free radicals or the oxygen, the, the unstable oxygen molecules that are out there that are causing damage. So we don't want any of that kind of stuff to happen. So we want to hopefully be able to give our older person good coping mechanisms so that they don't end up having these untoward effects of having stress. Thank you for joining me for Stress and Disease. I hope you'll take a few moments now and think about some things in your life that are causing you stress. Start looking for better ways to be able to deal with those stressors so that you don't end up having some of these long-term consequences that occur with stress leading to disease. Thanks again for joining me. This is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.